in Dubai and with JP and drinking wine. What can go wrong? Cheers, bro. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here, say, bro. There's nothing that special about you drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> Just maybe the fact that we're drinking in Dubai together. You know, I was actually thinking, this is like the second time we've drunk wine together recently. And not only have we seen each other more than we've ever seen each other, but I, I never really pegged you as a drinker before. And now you're like asking me to get the wine out. Oh, I love wine. <laughs> I, I'm not really a drinker in that, like, I, you know, I drink every day. But I really appreciate good wine. Like there's always red wine in the house. Always. Now I'm not a connoisseur like you. I'm learning from you. Connoisseur is just a polite word for alcoholic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but I'm definitely not either of those. But uh, yeah, I like to. I like to drink wine. I really like to drink red wine. It's just the good red wine. Like the, like I had one the other day with uh, with some friends, and it just was as it hit your palate. It was just like. Oh, amazing. I mean, for me, it's it's the same or as important, if not more important, than the food. And I think, you know, um, that's why I've never, if I've needed to kind of not drink for a while when uh, you know, if I'm trying to work out or trying to get my head in the game, I've never found it hard to not drink because, um, you know, I never drink to get drunk. You know, I, mean, I, I, I never really drank as a kid because, you know, for, for me, if I do get a bit tipsy off wine, then that's a side effect of, of drinking great wine or you know, just drinking wine, I guess, in general, as opposed to the fact that I'm kind of setting, setting out there to get pissed. So, yeah, I mean, unless, unless it's great, then I, I don't want to drink it. And it is, when it is great, it is just it's such an unbelievable experience. I mean, it really is an experience, you know, drinking good wine. And I've never seen you wasted or anything like that, so... I've always seen you drinking for the appreciation of what you're drinking. Yeah, I always say it's hard to get me drunk. <laughs> like in my head, I like to think I can down three bottles of wine and still be completely accomplished. Yeah. Have you ever drank anything else? Well, I As actually... like, um, I drink this every, every week. So, so, I didn't start drinking wine until I was about 30. Didn't, mm -hmm. Couldn't even stand the taste of it. Uh, before that, I used to drink some of ice. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, and we were like, we're talking. Real and raw <laughs> with Matt Aycox. We're talking one extreme to the other. I'll tell you what happened. Uh, I mean, yeah, literally, he's never liked the taste of wine. As a kid, my dad, you know, it was one of those things where my dad was like, oh, try this. You know, and mm. he, used to, he used to always drink wine. I, you know, I guess I'll, I'll sound like a wine snob now. So in, in hindsight, you know, they never, he never drank the kind of wine, wine that I like to drink now. But he'd always, he'd always have a bottle of wine you know, with dinner or around, around the house. And I'd been offered it to try so many times, I just I never really enjoyed it. Um, and so all through my 20s, like I say, if I, if I was going out to a nightclub or something, I'd have a a vodka, vodka orange or normally like a, a, a um, what's that drink called or a white Russian you know vodka oh, yeah. colour and Baileys or I mean, proper Delvoy girly drinks yeah. um, and then when, literally when I was about 30 uh, I was out one night in Manchester I was out with Harley's mum we gone for dinner in this great Manchester restaurant called Wings and um, she, she was sat there she didn't drink wine either and when we were ordering a drink before dinner she said oh I think I'll have a glass of Merlot I remember looking at her face, you don't even know what Merlot is, like, you know, how are these words coming out of your mouth? Anyway, she orders a glass of Merlot, I ordered whatever I ordered. And I said, oh, she goes, oh, I like this, you should try it. So I've tried a little bit, but then it was nice enough. So we sat down to dinner and she goes, oh, should we get a bottle of wine? So I had a clue what I was ordering, but we've got a wine list. And this wine, this uh, restaurant in Manchester, although it's Chinese, it's quite well known having a decent wine cellar. The guy who owns it's a bit of a wine fanatic. And he, uh, I looked at the wine list and we bought a bottle, let's just say for argument, said this bottle was 100 quid. Didn't know what I was drinking, but look what I liked it. Anyway, we finished that, she was going to get another bottle. <laughs> she moved on to another bottle, let's say this bottle was like 200 quid. So we've drunk that. And then she, and we finished that, she goes, should we get one more? Are you kidding me? So anyway, I called, I called Wing over, Mr. Wing is called from this Chinese restaurant. And, uh, <laughs> that's true. And I said, listen, I said, I know nothing about wine. I said, but when you drink a hundred, how do you know like the difference between a hundred and two hundred and six hundred pounds? Like, what are all these different bottles? It's like the hundred pound bottle that touched the senses of your tongue, yeah? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's like the two hundred pound, that's like involving your ears as well. <laughs> he goes, but by the time you get to this bottle, that uses seven of your six senses. I'm like, fucking bring it to the table. <laughs> <laughs> this guy knows how to sell. Oh. So and we, and we, drank, we drank that bottle as well. Talk about emotional selling. <laughs> so like I said, I had no idea what we were drinking, but I just knew I was, in, I was really enjoying what we were drinking. And I guess it's like, you know, 
whether it's serendipitous or, 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 or whatever, but literally the next day it was Sunday and I'm reading the Sunday Times uh, and they always have a, um, in the money supplement, the back page is always something called like how I made it or something like that. And it's always a, a full page article with an interesting person, a business owner, a celebrity, you know, whatever it may be about mm -hmm. money. And um, it was an interview with this guy called Stephen Williams, who owned a business called the Antique Wine Company. Uh, and basically, it was explained that Stephen was a um, was owned, owned a wine business that sold wine for investment and drinking purposes. I didn't really know what this was, but I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And after last night, <laughs> and I know I like wine, and I'd actually invested a lot in art up to that point, but I'd fallen out of my art dealer. Um, and I, and I, I wasn't buying any more art, so I thought I'm going to email this Stephen. So I've emailed Stephen. I said, Hi, I said, just read about you in the Sunday Times this morning, a great, great article. Uh, I said, I used to invest in art, but now, now I invest in wine, but now I'm being interested to invest in wine, but I don't know anything about it. So uh, I said, Maybe if you want to train me up, you can get some of my money. So he just emails me about saying, Oh, you know, thanks for the message. Here's, a, here's our price list of everything we've got at the moment. So I've replied to him saying, as I said, I don't know anything I'm talking about. So if you want me to come and buy some stuff, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to teach me. Um, and he says no problem. He goes, we do a lot of tastings um, at, at, at uh, our um, facility in London. Why don't you come down? So um, I went down literally about two weeks later to their tasting of um, a wine called Chateau Pontecane. For anyone listening or watching this who knows wine, uh, I mean. Well, I say it's about as good as it gets. So you know, it, it's probably it's not a f what they call a first growth wine. I'm going to say it was like like a second, but one that arguably could be first. But you know, unbelievable wine. And this was the, this was the first wine tasting I'd gone to. I didn't even particularly know. So I rock up to this great wine tasting facility in the centre of London. It's like a a school laboratory underground, but done really fancy. So you've got wow. all these benches that you sit on, and someone comes at the, someone presents at the front, like you all try your wine. So we've sat down, I've gone there with Harvey's mom, and we've, there's like 12 wine glasses in front of you. And um, obviously these glasses have all got a little bit of wine in each one. And then someone's at the front and present. And yeah. the person presenting was a guy called Alfred Tesseron, who was the owner of Chateau Pontecane. So this guy, French-speaking guy, a reasonable English, he's come, he's come over to, to present to us, or obviously to present and flog, mm -hmm. flog to us, um, but they would do what they call a vertical tasting, so the vertical is like the same wine of every vintage. So we were drinking something like, I forget, from 2000 to say 2010 or 12 or whatever the story dates back to. So we're trying a bit of wine for, for, for each year, and they make a cognac there as well, so we're trying the cognac. I was sat on a table with six or seven other people who I don't know. There's all these other tables. And the middle of the table is what I now know is called the spittoon, where, um, <laughs> where, where so everyone drinks their wine, you know, tastes it, and spits it into this spittoon. I don't know what it is, so I'm there sipping the wine, drinking the wine. <laughs> and, and they'll be coming, they'll be, they'll be coming around. They'll be saying, oh, any wine you like? Like, yeah, I like that number three. Yeah, and topping me up with some number three, I'm drinking some more. And the person, and the person next to me, I said to her, I'm, the only, I'm asking for more wine here, and you guys are all spitting it in this thing in the middle, you know, what's going on? And obviously this like posh old London lady looked at this northern Neanderthal like, like a piece of shit, and she looks at me, she goes, yes, we all know how much further we've got to go through tonight. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, love. <laughs> so they're all, they're, all, they're all making the notes, and it's like, you know, um, scents of vanilla with the aroma of chocolate paste or whatever. And I'm like, didn't really like number two. Number three is better than number one. <laughs> and these, yeah, these are all my notes at the end. And then at the end, you get to fill an order form in of anything you want to buy. So I'm like, I have 10 cases of one, I have six cases of this. I'm, I'm convinced now, like, 11 o'clock at night, I'm, 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 I'm completely <laughs> mad. I'm, I'm ordering all this wine, ordering this cognac. Everyone else has gone home at this point. Now Alfred Tessa on the area of the chateaus, like, sat on my school bench with me. I've got my arm around just trying to, <laughs> trying to drink out of the spittoon. And um, anyway, gone home. And the next morning, uh, I got a phone call, um, and it was one of these sales ladies from this, from this wine company. And she was, oh, uh, Matt, yeah, it was great to meet you last night. Just calling to confirm your order. And uh, we've got another tasting next week. Would you like to come down? 
I'm surprised, I'm surprised I'm invited to anything else. I, I can't imagine after what I've saw last night that I'm your usual customer. And she goes, oh, we like our customers to come in all shapes and sizes. <laughs> I'm like, is that your polite way of saying you're a twat but you just spent five grand on Ponte Cane so, so we'll get you down again next week. And, uh, and that's, how my, that's how my wine drinking journey started, to be honest. Man, that's so. amazing. So literally a decade ago, you moved from Spanifies. <laughs> to, to, to the best to the best red wine in Bordeaux. Wine in the world. Yeah. And now so. you really really love it a lot. I, I really love it. I mean listen, I, I won't I'm not gonna say I'm an expert in any way, yeah. shape, or form, but you know, I I know in, I know enough to be able to have some kind of appreciation of what I'm drinking. Mm -hmm. I know what I like and I know what I don't like. So you know if I sit in a restaurant I'm quite comfortably now I want grapes like this or that. But I think you're passionate. I also think, for me, like with anything, you've got to, you know, the key is to enjoy what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And whilst I'm sure many would look at me as a wine snob because I only drink, you know, what well, I was going to say only, but let's say primarily drink what yeah. we call you know, pretty pricey wine. But my rule with it is, I've still, I've still got to love it. You know, when you go to these wine dinners where, you know, you must pair the white wine with the fish and the sweet wine with all this. I don't give a shit about any of that bollocks. I, I like what I like, and if I want to drink a, diet, a nice heavy red wine with the lightest fish, well, then that's what I want to do because, you know, I, 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 want, to, I want to enjoy the taste. But yeah. um, it's, it's certainly is a passion, but I'll tell you what I like as well with the wine is, is kind of imagining the story and stuff behind it, in particular, like the kind of romanticism of the age. So like you know what well, last time we were together we drank that that, that nineteen sixty two and obviously, obviously there's another story with that bottle <laughs> that we won't talk about but um, the fact that that was bottled in nineteen sixty two you know twenty years before I was born yeah. and you did, and you just think actually drinking you're just thinking you know sixty years ago some fella was you know being dragged by a horse through a field pulling grapes that he was then treading on and that's you know and obviously I don't know what the journey is but you know that's that's what interests me that people journey. in a fucking vat or whatever mm. stamping on bloody grapes just so you can have, taste this and this you know, wine on, on your tongue and it's sitting that it's sat in that bottle you know 20 years before I was born through my entire life through Harvey's entire life and now you know now, now, now we're drinking it's it it's so crazy that through your birth that wine was already there yeah it was already there. Already had my name on it. Forty years later. <laughs> so crazy. And this is something that actually, you know, I really wanted to uh, talk about. We kind of went to it, went into it in the car the other day. Looking, talking about looking back. Um, you know, for me, I think a lot of people underestimate the power of hindsight. Looking back, and you know, we just spoke now. Looking back, you know, I know what I like and stuff, and I know what I don't like, and. You, know, you say, oh, you're not a connoisseur, we're not an expert, but we only know what we know at our current level of awareness. So based on the awareness that you're at right now, you know what you like and what you don't like. Maybe as you continue to raise your awareness, as you do, because like myself, you're a fucking obsessed student, and you're always learning more. Maybe one day you will know what wine to put with what fish. But I have a saying in my, in my I guess, coaching business and life. Reflection guides you to the truth and the truth sets you free. Right, the second half of that most people know the truth sets you free. But reflection guides us to the truth. And looking back, I think, is one of the most powerful things you can do. Because for me, the most powerful lessons in my life have come in hindsight. Not looking down or looking forward, it's been looking back. Like I would love to know from your perspective, because I get to share it all the time. But from your perspective, looking back, what have been the most powerful lessons for you? And we can break that down into many areas. Like, for example, you have just gone into a fitness journey. And I tell you this all the time. Well, at least I tell you this a few times. I love to see you in this fitness, um, I guess, activities that you're doing. Based on what you've been sharing with me, how you're feeling, and the energy that it's giving you, etc. Looking back, would you have changed anything? Or what have you learned about fitness looking back from this morning's workout with the Jaguar over your whole life? Jaguar, we're so happy you got a mention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is for you, Steve. <laughs> he paid me for that. <laughs> he paid me for the plug. Looking back in hindsight, what is fitness for you? So is it 
it's interesting that you've kind of specified that question then because I was thinking of uh, almost like a different line, a different answer before. But I think the biggest thing I've so two big learnings with exercise for me then. One is the power of it that is everything mm -hmm. other than the exercise itself. I, you know, okay, the, the exercise is a, is a task in and of itself, but mm -hmm. the real benefit, you know, the real benefit comes in the in in the energy uh, that, that that it creates within you, and then the power, therefore, that that then has mm -hmm. on everything else it, it, it is you want to do in life. But I think if I had to if I had to tell my let's say younger self or my 20, 25 year ago self something, it would be about the power of consistency, because mm -hmm. I think that is what has put me off exercise in the past. I mean, I, obviously, a couple of things put me off. That, I mean, like even today, there's lots of exercise that I don't enjoy. And that's why you know, we were talking earlier about how I was saying it's so important to find exercises that you do love because you know, then, you know, then you don't give up on it. But I think for me, if I'm, when I'm 20, 22, 25, whatever, I'd, I'd always do a bit of exercise, but I'd never, I'd never properly commit to it because I think I'd struggle to ever see the results. Um, I guess I was probably wanting too big a results and too soon. Mm -hmm. And you know, I guess, you know, maybe at 25, I'm thinking, well, I want to have the men's health cover uh, body magazine, you know, magazine body, mm -hmm. or, you know, I, I want to, I want to be a, a black belt, you know, karate student or, or, or whatever it may be. And because I, because I don't get there in a week, I get, to, you know, I, I get despondent. Yeah. And uh, I've heard a few times, uh, you know, pe people say lately that, um, you know, that, that expression that you overestimate what you can do in a year and you underestimate what you can do in 10 years. I think that completely, you know, just translates to that power of consistency. And I look at myself now, like today, at the end of that, that session I did this morning, where I was completely fucked, I mean, literally dripping and dying. And before I left, he says, you've got to do 20 burpees. Now, if you'd have asked me six months ago, I couldn't do 20 burpees at the beginning of the session, never mind 20 burpees at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's not, it's not some magic trick that I can do with now, it's that I started off with one burpee, and one became two, and two became four, and, you know, four became ten, you know, and ten, ten is now twenty. I've seen you struggle with ten push-ups. So the fact that you're fucking just ripping out burpees, and I've seen you do it, that is testimony to just keep showing up consistently. And, and, that, and, that, and that's the lesson, like you say, you know, showing up is 80% of the battle. And you know, but, you know, just that power of consistency that you know what, well, yes, today it's going to be tough, and tomorrow it's going to be tough, and after a week, you're probably not really going to be seeing any results, and after a month, you might not be seeing many results. But then one day, you just wake up, and that you know, that snowball that, you know, that snowball has hit you. And I guess if you use that analogy of that snowball, you know, when you're rolling it, you know, it's, it's like impossible to roll at first, isn't it? You know, it's tiny and, and, and for you know, seconds, if not minutes, it's impossible to roll. Then it's a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And then you just look at it one, you know, look at it one roll and the thing's like a fucking foot long. Um, and there's, there's no shortcut. This is a bit of a selfish question for me mm. because, you know, to, like, we're friends. And if I see a friend of mine that doesn't get the significance of fitness. I often say that if you think it's about fitness or abs or whatever, you've seriously fucking missed the point. So when I see someone that I care about not get it, it gets to me. So I wanted to capture this moment to be able to share with other people, you know, maybe if, if they haven't got it for a long time, now maybe, you know, this conversation can give them a little bit of permission to say, actually, you know what? For a guy that's not been into fitness and now he is into fitness and he's saying these are the benefits and I'm feeling better and I've got the energy, etc. Maybe I would, uh, I should give it a go. Um, and you know we had a, we had a workout. I don't know what it was a month and a half ago, and we were just chatting on WhatsApp and I was like, bro, just keep fucking just even if you have ten minutes, just I think I gave you like a ten minute workout. That is the key. It is the only thing you need to focus on is showing up every single day. The easiest way to get fit is train every day. The easiest way to learn Spanish is speaking is speak every, every day. The easiest way to learn how to trade is fucking trade every day or sit on your screen or sit on your books, etc. So, so that's the fitness element. So thank you so much for Let me say one sure. more thing on fitness before we go on then because this is such a real life, such a real life example of 
you know, two people who I won't name, but they, you know, it's quite obvious to anyone who knows who they are, but they, I'm sure, won't mind me talking about them. I've got two very key people in, in my organisation who, um, who <laughs> I've had different struggles with for different reasons. You know, mm-hmm. one, 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 of the pers- one of the particular people is amazing, but they, uh, and you know what, I mean, I haven't got any criticisms of them whatsoever, um, other than the fact that, uh, you know, I would look at their personal life and say that, you know, they probably drank too much or smoked too much or maybe part- partied too much, which, you know, <laughs> maybe they see as fun as a young person, but I, I can see that it's probably inhibit- inhibit- inhibiting them in, in some way, shape or form, and they'd be better off without it. I think got another person who undoubtedly is good at the work, but is just underperforming in every area for me. Um, and but not underperforming because he can't do the work, but underperforming because I think his personal life is all over the shop. Um, and with the, one of the one of the people, the, the first person I mentioned, who who is great in every every area for me, um, I I gave a couple of personal training sessions a week with uh, with the guy I trained with back in Leeds, Burno. And you know, for the first you know week or two, she kind of struggled. Then got into a bit, and then kind of one a week became two a week. And I think she even topped it up with some of her own now. And I look at her now. Who, and like I said, she was always an amazing person for me anyway. But she's she looks like a different person, whole new lease of life. You know, she she dresses different to work. You know, she you know she's more motivated. She's she's you know she wants to build teams. She wants to you know, really develop a career more and more. And for me, that is purely down, you know, you know, d- yeah. down to the power and energy that's come to her from the next test, because she was already shit and everything else anyway. You know, but that's, you know, it's, it's done something in her life that, you know, that pushes her on. And, the, and then the other example is this other guy who, like I say, I'm sure he could do the work, but I never got to see any results because, you know, there was always so many barriers in the way because of his personal life. Mm-hmm. And you know, we, we had quite a few tough talks together. Um, and I basically insisted he now went went to went to see went to see the same trainer too, because I felt that the exercise would change him. And I also think the trainer himself will be a good guy to kind of you know, give yeah. this guy a spurring on. And we're, we're probably only four, five, six weeks, six weeks maximum into this now. And don't worry, he's not training anywhere let's say near as much as I am but you know compared to compared to what he is before you know he he's now messaging me going I've had the best night of sleep I've ever had That's or amazing. you know I mean I'm eating broccoli I've never eaten broccoli before I've stopped drinking you know the mates are out on the party this weekend I'm not um, and you know look, it's the beginning of the journey but I'm already seeing a big difference in him as an individual and again it can only be brought back to the exercise but you said we can give example after example after example. Like you said, you said exercise isn't about abs. You know, and like I said, exercise, it's not about fitness. And it's not even about, like I said, it's not about me telling you to enjoy exercise. Look, it's better if you do enjoy it, hence find an activity you like. Like, I like boxing, I don't like rowing. I'll box two hours, three hours a day mm-hmm. if I could. I won't do 10 minutes rowing. Therefore, it's so important to find what you like. But when you find what you like and you commit to it, the benefits are everywhere other than the gym. Mm-hmm. So, like, yeah, well, I was going to say, does that, does that make sense? But I, don't course, need, I, I don't need to tell you, do I? So. Yeah, I mean, what, it, it makes sense for everyone else right. watching or listening to this. And no, I never thought a year, two years ago, three years ago, that we would be having this conversation <laughs> about fitness and the benefits of fitness. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I could just, I knew this was going to happen. We weren't even meant to talk about this. And I'm conscious of the fact that you have a dinner coming up very soon. So... Um, you know, not to go on too long sitting here in your amazing apartment, I do want to ask you one more question. Uh, and the reason why I want to ask you this question is because we were talking about this the other day. Now, on the surface level, to everyone watching and listening, this will seem like a very meh question, like, um, you know, that everyone may ask. But I'm very interested to get your perspective and to get to get your answer, which is going to be very personal. So here's the question. You said to me, the, you know, actually, let me say the thing and then I'll ask you the question. You said to me the other day while we were driving in your car, you said, I used to think that I needed nine figures. And now I realize that seven figures will suffice. I think you said that. <laughs> so, 
It's so funny you're asking me this because I was actually thinking earlier. I'm so glad that I've got JP around because he, he spurs me on. And I actually thought, I was thinking about that conversation. I thought, I told JP seven figures will suffice. What kind of video? What kind of video? <laughs> <laughs> I need, I need, uh, I was, and you know why? I, I just, um, I try and justify to myself when, when I'm having bad days. And it's like, and it's, I, I was, I was watching um, a training on hiring today, and someone was talking about something which I see as parallel to that statement just then, when they were saying that you know, there's no great companies that have got two members of staff. There's probably also yeah. no great companies that have got twenty members of staff. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the the great companies, you know, I've, I've got scale and I've got you know h- hundreds of people, you know, you know, running at scale and culture at, at X, Y, Z, and. You know, there's always that expression that small is beautiful. And I've, throughout my career, go through peaks and troughs of wanting to build something big and then thinking, quite a few problems in being big. I can actually make more money by being small. Mm. But it's just me kidding myself and justifying to myself that I'm failing at being big at the moment because how can you make more money being small than being big? It, it, it doesn't make okay if you're getting if you're getting it wrong on the journey to being big, yeah. then of, then, then, yeah, then of course you can. That's but true. H- how is it conceivable to say that me as a two man band computer seller can make more more money than Apple? You know, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a ridiculous statement. So I think uh, yeah, you know, we we uh, we sell ourselves stories of the beauty of smallness mm. to justify failing when we're trying to go big. So I want to... Not, 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 <laughs> that's, that's not what you're asking me, but yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, no, but I'm glad that you shared that because it's really going to open up what we're going to discuss now, hopefully. So I'm, I'm not going to challenge you on that, but I get what you mean. Mm. And I think what I took from that conversation was you felt like you needed, emphasis on the word need, nine figures, but then you realize through becoming more fulfilled, happier living a life that you love that actually you don't need nine figures seven figures will suffice is that how you said suffice yes yeah that's what so in terms of a need but you can still want fucking 10 figures 11 figures but there's such a big difference between need and want Mm. you know you kind of the energy that you brought to the conversation was oh i have to have this i have to have this but actually now you're like no i don't have to i want to and that's a very different energy. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what I was specifically talking about, what I always used to think is, you know, when that's contextualized at nine figures, I used to think, oh, you know, I need a huge house in, 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 in all these different countries. Yeah. I need a jet to fly between them and a fleet of cars out, outside each one. And whilst, you know, what I now appreciate is that as whilst I can not imagine that I could ever be satisfied with you know with peanuts and 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 you know i guess you know li- living in a studio with no money the concept of having all of that stuff is semi is semi ludicrous and i think you know and what i've learned and it's an expression that i nicked from someone else who said it years ago is every set of keys brings, brings another set of problems mm-hmm. and um you know w- w- when when i look at a lot of the stresses i have in life the they're probably brought from unne- you know, unnecessary, you know, material irritants. You know, yeah. you know, you, you you've got, and ultimately, you know, what do you need that house in that country for? And, and like this, is, and this is, becomes like a, a philosophical conversation. Because, and and, and again, you know, there's no there's no right answer. And you know, you could yeah. argue you could argue if you've got all the money, then it doesn't matter what you what you need. You you, you get what you want. But I guess you know, the way I see it is. Like, like a lot of people say to me, I'm stupid for buying the boat. Um, but my justification... I totally disagree. <laughs> but, well, my justification to myself, and it could be just justification, but I, people say, why would you buy? You should just charter. I think you should charter if you're doing it once or twice or three weeks yeah. of the year. But I, I used that boat this summer three and a half months solid. And you're a fucking master of bringing people constantly exactly you know so, so for me the two things are i'm using it for such a depth of time that it would it can't possibly be cheaper for me to charter than buy but secondly whatever the cost of it is i will make that cost back whether yeah. that's in in enjoyment and marketing and networking and you know bringing investors bringing clients uh, so that, that's my justification for me but i think if i had 
three votes in three countries, mm -hmm. then I couldn't possibly get value out of it. Yeah, so yeah. I, I guess that, that's 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 and probably your personal on. branding is so strong. So to have the squirter and pink, it's just. I mean, it's so personal to you. <laughs> you know, if, it, it's not like you go to Marbella, Ibiza, south of France, and you look at a yacht and you say, I think that's Matt Haycock's yacht. <laughs> no, you fucking know. You know that's his yacht. Because <laughs> it says the sea squirter. And it has pink furniture. <laughs> but, um, bro, as always, I'm just loving our conversation. And I haven't even got to the question. <laughs> I haven't even got to the question. And, you know, I, because of a lack of time, I can't even get into I wanted to, you to challenge me on this whole smaller is better because that's where I'm at. Like, you know, I was trying to expand and do all these things and then realize charging 10, um, five and six figures for coaching. I was like, man, I can just do private coaching and invest into small businesses, 10 grand, five grand, 20 grand, into properties. But that's, I think, time-wise, that's gonna have to well, be well, we, we, should, we should have that conversation tomorrow because, because yeah, because there is a whole, I mean, you've not even told me your full, your full story on that, mm -hmm. but as soon as you were saying that to me, about, you know, I could be smaller and just, you know, work with a smaller number of people at, at, at a higher value. I'm already in my head thinking, well, yeah, you can, but then what is then stopping, stopping someone else you know, um, not licensing, but let's say managing managing the JP content for the, for, for, for the next tier of people, then what's we'll, we'll stopping someone else managing the JP content for yeah. the people who can only afford, uh, afford 10 quid a month? I'm just a really fucking terrible manager. And um, so, so I guess going back to that, you know, to, to that small is beautiful, it's, it's like me saying to myself, yeah, I could, I don't know, let's say have a lending book of 5 million quid with just me and, you know, one account to go on one underwriter. And that would make more money than let's say a fifteen million pound book when I'm running it badly. Yeah. But if I can get the organisation and the infrastructure in place, how can I possibly make more mon more money with a five million pound book than I could with a five hundred million pound book? Mm -hmm. And and yeah, you know, you could make yourself you know, a a great amount of money and a good lifestyle with ten clients paying fifty grand a year or ten yeah. clients paying hundred grand yeah. a year, but. The content, within reason, the content's the same content, whether it's delivered to that person, that person, or that person. Always. Therefore, it's just finding the methods of distribution and delivery, and you can hit everybody. Mm. You know, I guess that would, could, would Tony Robbins be making more money if he was only seeing his high net worth? Well, no, he wouldn't be. But Tony Robbins has got 500 or whatever the number is of people working 24 hours yeah, around the clock, his deliver, delivering so his, his content. I mean, even if he charges, you know, he says publicly, I charge a million a year plus an upside of your business. But if he had 20 of those clients, he's still not going to make what he makes, you know, from yeah. running all these events. But anyway, so we, we're going more well, let's, let's do that conversation that. tomorrow I'll because I'll be a good one. Because I think that, you know, that's something that really is aligned to, I guess, what you do. And this is why I asked you the other day, like, at what, uh, at what amount do you take on uh, investors etc because Jules and I thought no oh, just like Jules would just fuel me to be the best coach you know you, you like coaches at the next level not my level the next level are charging 100 grand 200 grand a year corporate contracts etc and then just put a, a percentage of that away go up north in the UK where we live buy small properties invest in a small business this person wants to start a salon this person wants to start a gym but uh, yeah, that's another conversation. So I still haven't got to my question. <laughs> I still haven't got to my question. I said before, this might sound like a um, cliche question, but I want to know your personal um, thoughts on this. And it's um, it comes from this nine figures to seven figures thing. But now at 40... <laughs> Now we're 33. <laughs> what do you believe is most important in life? And I, I don't even need to say, be honest, because I know you're going to be. So I'm just saying that now out loud because I want you to know that this is no fucking answer for a camera. Like, this is going to be your truth. Well, it's a, it's a cliche question, which I don't give a cliche answer, but I always say that I think cliches are kind of cliches for a reason because it can, you know, they kind of are true. I think I think um, happiness and freedom. Now, what what that looks like for different people is different things. 
And you know, if you ask me the same question on a different day of the week, whilst the underlying answer might be the same, I might give you a different answer of what happiness and freedom as actually is. As in the vehicle is. for what, how, you, how, you, how you're fulfilling that. Yes, yeah. as in, you know, <laughs> I may think that happiness is nine figures when, 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 yeah. I, when, when I realise that, you know, freedom is seven figures. Yeah. Um, so yeah, how an answer may depend what, what mood I'm going in, but, you know, the older... But the destination is still the same. The destination is the same. And the older I get, yeah. the more the more I do realise the, the, the importance of being able to wake up, you know. I say stress-free, I'm always, I don't want to say it in a, in a naive way because, mm -hmm. you know, you can't have it all and, you know, you can't, you know, you can't have, um, let's say, great, great money and a great life and X, Y, Z and no stress. You know, the, 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 I guess anything, any upside always has its degree of downside, so it's how, how do you balance that and how do you manage it? But um, but yeah, you know, I understand now more and more the importance of not running around like a headless chicken or a busy fool, uh, not doing things for ego or vanity, and um, and being and again, you know, that might sound daft to a lot of people watching or listening because I'm sure so many things I do look like ego, ego and vanity. But um, but that is that is definitely definitely my answer. But uh, on on that, I agree. People looking at you, they don't know you. They'll think this guy's all about vanity and ego. But when you meet, when you know Matt, you know it's just not the case. He just loves. He knows what he fucking loves. And for me too, there's a lot of things that I do, like including. Let's just speak to the elephant in the room in both our cases, like tattoos. A lot of people think that I have tattoos for ego. I just fucking love tattoos. I really love tattoos, and I don't need people's permission for me to to be creative with my canvas you know because that's all to that's to me that's all it is it's just a canvas I just realize i keep hitting the mic on my chest but um yeah so so you realize now what's important and it's happiness and freedom and in my opinion freedom to elaborate on that to do what you want when you want how you want where you want with who you want I think that is everything. Mm -hmm. And the, the enemy of that, and this is where it comes to you, what fucking so inspires me about you, the enemy of freedom is caring what other people think. 100%. And let me just tell you, like, I feel like I need to face the camera now. Everyone in the world wants to be happy. Matt mentioned happiness. Now, I work in this area of happiness and freedom, right, as a coach. To be happy, you need to feel free. Free what? Free to be you. The enemy of that, which you need to become friends with and accept and, 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 and move through, is the opinions of others. And that is the enemy of extraordinary. That is the enemy of freedom. That is the enemy of happiness. And I, have, I had a client recently that had a mansion, his own investment fund in the millions, Aston Martin, and after working with me, I said, what did you get from this? He said, JP, I'm just happy. I'm happy. And, and that is the most important thing. Everyone wants to be happy, but like Matt said, your vehicle is your vehicle. But the important, but the important thing, I guess, is to know what makes you happy and to go for it. Because listen, whilst... <laughs> yeah, I guess... I would, I'm not going to say, I, I won't for a minute say the more money you have, the happier you're not. But I also believe there has to, you have to have a base level of money. Now everybody's, ba everybody's base yeah. level is different, but you have to have a base level because it's the money that brings the freedom and the freedom that brings the happiness. But I tell you what, I don't know many of my wealthy mates or acquaintances, people with big, big money, who are really happy. I think they're all, they're all, they're all doing but but then again, and this is like another whole whole level of conversation. Yeah. But it's all you know for me down down to mindset or you know following yeah. feeling the need to follow convention or feeling the need uh, you know to to to, to keep other people yeah. happy. But it's something I've said a lot lately when people say to me, "Oh my God, you know, how did you move to Dubai? You know, I'd love your lifestyle, this and the other." And I say, "Well, if you if you know if you're a let's say a skint person or someone with not much money." 
you can move to Dubai for a seven hundred good plane ticket, and 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 take and, and take you know take whatever job it is you're doing in the UK and come and try and find a way yeah. to do it in Dubai. If you've got a load of money, then why are you even asking me the fucking question? But you know, you, you can move tomorrow, and um, yeah, I, I think so many of these happiness things are, are are just down to perception, mindset, you know, keeping mm-hmm. other people happy or feeling that you've got to do what everybody else does. Yeah, shout out to the happiness minister in Dubai and happiness. <laughs> yes, it's an actual happiness rate in Dubai. And um, yeah, I can't remember what I was going to say now. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, dude. I really. Whoa! I was going to say you were so I, I, late. I'm going to I'm going to have happiness removed from my. You're so late. I have my, ball, have my balls chopped. I just looked at my watch. Please don't. What time is it? Fuck. It's about nine. Twenty past nine. I can get there. But we'll finish talking tomorrow. Oh man, JP. I, I wanted to say more, but yeah. No, <laughs> no, 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 we're going to do this again tomorrow because that's the great thing of having you around, whether it's on camera or off camera. You know, I love, I love your questions. I love uh, your train of thought. And, uh, you know, it always, uh, like I said, it's re-inspired me to go back to nine figures and stop pissing around with seven. <laughs> and the last, last thing I want to say sure. is, and I said this to you in Ibiza when you invited me to stay with you in Ibiza, uh, I love how you're happy on your journey. So many people, successful people, or chasing success, maybe not they yet, are so caught up in the journey and the stress of the journey that they they aren't actually enjoying themselves. And the reason why I'm very protective of my circle, Jules always jokes I have no friends. And the reason why I like to hang out with you is you just fucking have a good time. And uh, and I love that about you. And uh, to come to the money thing on a separate note, and I'll be thirty seconds. <laughs> Uh, we talk, you know, we talked about our oh, money is not important and stuff. And yes, it is. You know, it is. But if you make money your everything, you're fucked. Mm-hmm. Because money will never ever be constant. It doesn't matter if you are a waiter, or if you're um, Warren Buffett. Money is never a constant. So you can't make your happiness money. But if you want to be happy, know what you want and know the money that you need to get it. For example. I worked out, I love to journal, I worked out two days ago that you can't have an abundant life in Dubai if you're not earning 50k a month. That for me is what I worked out. Now that's like truly abundant, like you're going out three times a week, you're renting a a sports car every few days, you're going on these uh, excursions or skydiving, 50k like obviously minus tax and Mm -hmm. that and all that stuff from the UK obviously. But uh, you need money. You need money to be happy. Anyway, bro, I'm talking too much. Listen, thank you so much. Thanks as always. It's been a pleasure. Let's thank cheers you one more time. Cheers. I'm going to eat my burrito while you go out for dinner. <laughs> <laughs>